To Walnut Creek. While we can't be together here in the sanctuary, we can worship from the comfort of our home 
and know that we are here for one another, even in times when we can't physically be together. As I sit on my couch at home, I look around the sanctuary and I see your faces from times past and I thank God for you. So welcome to worship in this special way. Our announcements this morning that I'll be telling you about are on the screen as well. The church office is going to be closed to the public until at least December 8th. Staff may be in the building, but they will not here, be here all at the same time, and we are not inviting anyone inside. You may contact the church office or Pastor Stacy for any needs that you might have, and the phone numbers are there and also on the Advent information that you received, either for the church office or to call Pastor Stacy directly. Our bishop's Christmas offering this year um, will go to support um, the Bishop of Indiana Children's Programs. Some of those include the Impact 2818, the Indiana Conference Camping Ministry, Basher Home, which we have supported here at Walnut Creek, is our United Methodist Children's Home and Youth Home, Local Outreach Projects, United Methodist Advanced Project. So how can you give to this bis Bishop's Christmas offering? You can mail your check into Walnut Creek here at the church and mark that offering bishop's christmas offering before uh, january 3rd of 2021 or you can go online to our website and select give now and then select the bishop's christmas offering so we we'll hope you will consider um, helping with that um, today or this week in-person worship for Christmas will be on Sunday, December 20th at 10 a.m. or Thursday, December 24th at 7 p.m. You must re reserve a seat for that. We have to control the numbers that we have here in the sanctuary. So you can call the church office at 267-4032 by December 17th to reserve your seat. And then finally, this is something that is so important. We are a praying church, and especially in these times, um, I find myself praying a lot throughout every single day. So as you have those prayer requests, please email the church office at wcumcadmin, uh, A-D-M-I-N, at walnutcreekchurch.com, or you can call or text Pastor Stacy at her number 260-415-6994, and that number is on the screen as well. We also want to let you know that the offering uh, this year for our Christmas families at Walnut Creek will be going to our two foster families. Um, traditionally, we have an angel tree and we take tags for that. Uh, instead, this year, we are requesting financial donations and that money will be split between our two foster families and used to purchase gift cards. Our foster families are Chad and Deb Kuhn and Scott and Lacey Moore. Um, Chad and Deb currently have an eight-year-old girl, a five-year-old boy, and a 16-month-old boy. This is in addition to their own daughters, Heather and Caroline. Scott and Lacey currently have five foster boys, ages eight months, 22 months, four years, five years, and 12 years. This is in addition to their own two children, Riley and Danica. So please consider, again, you can mail that in and mark your donation to be the Christmas family before December 20th, or you may also go online to Walnut Creek to our website and choose Give Now and select the Christmas family.
As we light our wreath each week, we remember the fullness of God's light to the world in Christ Jesus. Today, we light our first candle, the glimmer of hope, and our second candle. Our second candle brings us to the path of peace, lighting our way to the wonder of God with us, Emmanuel. Hello, Walnut Creek. This is Miss Hillary. Some of you might know that our family grew this year. So although 2020 is getting a really bad reputation, it certainly has brought some great joy along with it for our family. We spent the beginning of the year preparing for our daughter's arrival. And as my body grew and grew and hers did too, we spent a lot of time in this room. I'm coming to you today from our daughter's room. And right now it looks like a perfect spot for a baby. But let me tell you, just a few months ago, it had a lot of junk in it. I mean, wrapping paper, boxes of old things, workout stuff. In fact, if you were on a Zoom call with me earlier this spring or summer, I was in this room with a big desk. There was all kinds of junk in this. And our family, I think, was a little afraid that this place was so full, there wouldn't be space for our sweet joy for our babe that was coming. But we spent a lot of time in here, a lot of work clearing the stuff away and made space for our joy that was coming. We put her crib in here and I imagined how little and sweet she would look in it. And I thought about how many nights I would be awake in the dark holding and snuggling her and how much patience I was going to need. We put her clothes in here, her books, her toys and diapers and all of the things that babies need. And as each thing I touched and her room was changing, my heart was changing too, just preparing and thinking about the mom that I want to be for her. So even more than the room changing for our sweet daughter, my heart was changing, preparing for our little love. So today as I talk to you a little bit more about Advent, and I've read the verses that Pastor Stacy has picked for today that focus on clearing the path and preparing our hearts for Jesus, I really think about the way that our family prepared for our daughter, specifically this room. We often use things to get ready when we're really getting ready in spirit. And each thing should be a reminder of the joy that is coming. So as we put up our Christmas trees this year and hold ornaments that our family have given us over the years, we thank God for being part of the family of Christ. When we put that star on top of the tree, we think about the wise men and what an unusual sight that was and the way they followed it to see Christ as a, as a young, babe. And as we pick out and wrap gifts for each other, we think about the gift we've been given that's so big we can never repay it. And even as we hang up Christmas lights, we remember that no matter how dark sin is, Christ is the light that overcomes it. Our hearts are changing as we think of our Savior and spend time with Him in the special time of preparation. So as we prepare for Christmas and the joy that Christ brings, let's make sure that our hearts are being prepared the most.
two scripture readings as we worship today. The first comes from the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, and the second comes from the book of Mark in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hand, hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins a voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Welcome to worship today. I'm Pastor Stacy Downing from Walnut Creek, and I am so glad that you are choosing to worship with us today and learn from the prophet Isaiah and the Gospel of Mark. So, Today, as we get started, I wanted to ask you, are you a highways or a byways person? Do you know? You have any idea? Well, let me tell you about my husband and I, and maybe that'll give you a bit of a hint. See, I am a byways person. I like to, when we move to a new community, I go, I just like get lost on the roads. I drive around whatever. I may not know the names of them, but I spend a lot of time just driving around. I still, when I'm going, like to uh, deliver the DVDs. I might go one way to get there and then I go another way back just to see uh, what kind of uh, roads there are and what kind of places there are. I tend to take the two-lane highways and the country roads. I was known in our last community where, there, where we lived where there were a lot of farms and rural country roads to come home with a van covered in gravel dust because I just kind of, um, well, take the road less traveled, I guess. And uh, so I like the byways, the, the scenic route, we'll say. Um, my husband, on the other hand, he's a highway guy. He could have absolutely nowhere to go and choose to get in the car and get on the highway and just drive. He likes to just listen to his music and just drive and not have to think about where he's going or what he's doing, just drive. And uh, I like the experience and the adventure of it. He thinks it's an adventure to be on a grand highway too because you never know where you might decide to stop. But I tend to like the byways. So how are you? I mean, the reason for highways is pretty obvious. They're, they're faster, they're smoother, they're more fuel efficient. If you're, if you're that kind of person, that's where you're gonna be. And uh, that's kind of an important way that we are able to travel definitely better than the foot and horse and buggy and mule and cat wagon days, um, even better than the Model T and Model A and, uh, you know, those sorts of days. But the fact of the matter is that highways are efficient. Um, I like the scenic route. I'll try to take the scenic route whenever I can, but the fact of the matter is I'm always running late, so I almost always am taking the highway, let's be honest, because I gotta get there. And that's the fastest, most efficient way to get there. So I emotionally am more of a byway girl, but I practically am a highway girl. So what about you? 
what what are you are you a highway or a byway sort of traveler how do you prefer to get to where you're going do you like the scenic and unpredictable are you more content with the smooth sailing of highway travel what is your preference what about in life you know we all have the scenic and the unpredictable, the, the gravel and pothole covered roads. We have the new discoveries and we have those painful, painful long detours. We've all had those in our lives, but um, we also have opportunities for smooth and efficient. We have opportunities for that smooth road. Do you consider the road you're on? Do you consider the path you're taking in life and in faith? Do you ever consider the road you're on as a bit of wonder? Because it is God's peaceful path for you? Do you consider and wonder in the peaceful path of God? We're going to consider that today as we look at the prophet Isaiah and the Gospel of Mark. And so I want you to think on how you like to travel, how you tend to travel, how you tend to perceive your life and both its potholes and gravel detours and its smooth sailing and efficient ways. I want you to think about your life and your faith and the ways that you journey along it. So. We have the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 to 5. The prophet is telling us that, um, that there is comfort. Yes, comfort for God's people. That's comfort, oh comfort my people. Um, that's what Isaiah says. He wants us to know that, that there is comfort ahead because there's, there's smooth sailing ahead. There's, um, there's a path ahead that's, that's, oh, it's, the hard path is over. The easy path is coming. And so you can, you can take a deep sigh of relief. Maybe you feel like that a little right now. We've got news of a vaccine for this virus. Um, I don't know if you recognize, but Kosciuszko County has had a little bit of a dip in its, um, its, its outbreak. I mean, we're still at a serious outbreak, but we're no longer um, critical as far as outbreak goes. So we're uh, moving in the right direction. We're going to hope we stay there. But, you know... Are you kind of in that Isaiah space where you're like, oh yes, comfort, oh comfort my people, there's a new way coming, there's something beyond what we're in. Because the reason Isaiah was saying this is God's people were in exile. They were oppressed and not able to worship in the ways that were important to them. Um, they were struggling with feeling separated from God because they were separated from the temple. And so, you know, I, Isaiah wanted them to know, you know, take comfort. There is a way coming that is better, that is different, that is grander, um, because it's not the way of suffering and exile and separation and oppression that you have been in. It, it's it's going to be a different way. And he says that time of being separate, exiled, and oppressed from our relationship with God um, is coming to an end. And um, he talks about um, a way being made, a highway being built up. And I want you to think a little bit about ancient highways, and they're not that different from ours. So um, think about highways. Our highways, um, they, they come naturally from the history of ancient highways. In ancient times, think uh, Israel, desert, wet, desert region, wet region, arid region, dry region, um, but also wet seasons. So um, yeah, the ground would get packed down easily and be a nice path or roadway. But then rain would come, and that packed roadway would get muddy. And um, it was a rough terrain. There's a lot of rocks and hills, and, um, and so they had highways to transverse for, um, for commerce and um, for travel. They had highways, much like we have highways, although ours are a little bit more engineered than theirs were. But there was still engineering and care involved in the ancient highways. First the path was made straight. Now, they didn't have explosives like we have and they didn't blast holes in mountains, but they would find the straightest path through the mountains and the hills and over the mountains and the hills and the valleys and the rocks. They would find the straightest path. And then they would also 
raise up the path. They would build up the road. And so they were looking for higher ground. They were looking for straighter path. And they also would look for not just straight, not just for raised up, but also an ability to make it smooth. So being able to remove the rocks and the brambles and the things that would make it a rough travel. So um, a highway in that time was a raised road. And uh, this is always in the, in the story of the Good Samaritan where I can kind of see why you would pass by on the other side. You could, he was off the side of the highway where he had been left for dead. And, um, and they could just walk to the other side of the highway where they were high up and over the bank where they couldn't really see. And, um, but the highway raised up, straight as it can be, and smooth. That's the highways of ancient times. Sometimes they would even use the rock like we would gravel today to help make it smooth. Um, flat stones. So, let's think about that. He speaks of a highway. He speaks of something being raised up, cleared and straight, and made smooth and level. Isaiah speaks of something like this that is coming a highway, a way that is coming, that is going to be a way that is high and smooth and level, not bumpy and gravel-filled and pothole-filled. It's not just any old road. A highway is the fastest and the smoothest, the most efficient. And in this case, Isaiah is saying it's the most efficient path to, to peace and relationship with God. It is um, the fastest, smoothest, and most efficient way to restore a relationship with God. It is a, well, it's God's highway. So this is what Isaiah says. He says, there's one coming, and the highway has been prepared for him. The way is prepared for him. Um, there's one coming that's going to restore us, that's going to take us out of this horrible situation. So comfort, oh comfort, my people, there's a way coming. And then, in Mark chapter 1, the story of John the Baptist, he lays out the path. He, he sets it up for us. Now, John the Baptist doesn't do it quite like that. What happens is Mark says, I want to tell you of this one who's coming, and the one that's coming is John the Baptist, and he's going, and he's kind of a rustic guy, and he's going to baptize with water for repentance of our sins. And then John the Baptist goes on to say, that, or it goes on to say that he is not the way, but he is making a way for the one who will be the way back to God. And uh, John the Baptist says that himself. He says, I am not the one. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm introducing you to the concept of repentance of sin through baptism because I want you to understand what that means as the true way, the complete way to God comes before you. And so I want you to think about the way, Jesus, the way. We know that that's where we're headed. That's what we're anticipating in this Advent season, the birth of Jesus. And the birth leads to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And I want us to think about that as a highway. More specifically, the ways the ancient highways were made. Because you see, first it says in Isaiah that the highway will be one that is raised up a highway, one that is raised up. The birth of Jesus is that raising up. It's that making a, a higher path, a, a path back to God from sin. And uh, then Isaiah goes on to say that it will be a clear and straight way, a clear and straight path. And um, that's the teaching of Jesus. Jesus doesn't just come into the world and make a way. He also teaches the way so that you and I can come to understand that any that listen to him can begin to understand the straight and clear path to God that's available to them. And then um, Isaiah goes on and talks about the smooth or level way of the highway. And this is the death and resurrection of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Um, the death and resurrection of Christ through the Holy Spirit, um, those are 
that's the, the smoothest part of the path because it's not like there is a task that we are set forth to get to that space. Jesus has done the hard task. He's leveled the ground so that we can attain God again. As that, you know, there's that picture of Christ who is the bridge over the chasm that sin creates. Well, um, in this case, that's exactly what we're talking about. Jesus is the smoothing and leveling of the separation um, between God and us through his death and resurrection through the Holy Spirit. Now, the truth is, Mark, through John the Baptist, did not say it exactly like that. Um, but he tells us that John is preparing a way, a path of peace. He tells us that um, John will make a way for the fullness of God to come through the Messiah, through the one, through the way. And John prepares the way by introducing Jesus, not by name, not even by, you know, relationship, because this is Jesus' cousin, but um, he introduces him by speaking of the one that is more than even John is. John is asking us to repent of our sin and be baptized with water. And then he goes on to say that there is one who will baptize you not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And that will be the one, the one that is the way, the true path to peace in our relationship with God. So the question I would ask you is, do you consider this way that's been made for you? Do you consider this path that's been set out for you? Is the Advent season of preparation, is it just another set of traditions that you live out? Or do you wonder in the work that has been done by God, that's been spoken by Isaiah, by John, and by Jesus, that provides for you a highway to peace with God? Do you just live out the traditions? Or do you take time to wonder in these stories that provide the way of peace? You see, we each have the opportunity to receive the baptism of Christ and to seek out the highway that Christ sets for those who follow him. We all have that opportunity. We do. In fact, we are going to remember our baptism on January 3rd in worship, and um, we're going to celebrate the gift of baptism. And if you are seeking out that gift of baptism, you let me know, and you can be a part of that worship service and claim baptism for your own. Not just baptism by water, but baptism by the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. We each do have that opportunity to receive the baptism of Christ and seek out the highway that Christ sets for those who follow him. But the wonderful point of our prophecy and gospel is this. God makes the way, a raised up way in the birth of Christ a clear and straight way in the teaching of Christ, a smooth and clear way in the death and resurrection of Christ through the Holy Spirit. God makes a way for us through Jesus Christ. Now let me be truthful. It's not that sin doesn't add some bumpy parts, some detours, some potholes, some construction zones, and all manner of other surprises along the way in our life. But the peace of the path in Christ that leads us to restoration with God, that's the point. That's what brought us here in the first place. The thing that brought us here in the first place is peace in our relationship with God. So let's not get caught up in the ride and forget the reason we're on this road. We're on this road because of Christ's path of peace to God. That's the wonderful thing about this Advent season is it, it gives us the chance to set ourselves right on that path of peace to God again. Let's allow the birth of Christ to be the uplifting event in our life that brings us above the common road of human existence and human sin. Let's make the teaching of Christ a clear and focusing facet to make our path straight in this world. Let's claim the power of the death and resurrection of Christ through the Holy Spirit to smooth our journey from sin and death to grace and life. 
You see, this is the glory of God. This is the glory of our Lord that, that uh, John the Baptist is talking about. This is the glory of the Lord that Isaiah is alluding to when he says, Comfort, O oh, comfort my people. There is a smooth journey from sin and death to grace and life. This is the way made for you and for me and all who come to Jesus Christ. This Advent season, let's revisit the wonder of the path of peace that is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let me invite you now to recommit to the way of Christ, to take a step in to the path of peace that is Jesus Christ. For any and all who seek Jesus are invited to his table. All who want that grace of God that he offers are invited to this time and this place. If you received one of our porch packs, you should have in your porch pack a portable communion for each member of your family. If you did not, I invite you to um, find something bread-like in your house, find the beverage of your choice and gather those together and uh, be ready. Let's receive communion together. Let us receive this gift of Jesus together and turn ourselves to Jesus again. In fact, let us pray a prayer of repentance and turning to Jesus right now. Holy Lord and gracious God, we thank you that we are able to come. No matter what the state of our heart or our mind or our world, we are able to come to your table. Any and all who seek you are welcome here, Lord. There are no limits to who is welcome at your table. And so, God, we come. And we admit as we come that we have failed. We've fallen short of being the goodness and grace that you have for us. We've not loved you with our whole hearts. We've not um, loved one another in the way that you call us to. We have not been obedient to your path. We have not um, cared as we are called to care for one another and for those in our world in need. Because of these things, Lord, as we come to your table, we say, I'm sorry. I seek your forgiveness I ask for your grace. Lord, bring me to your table and forgive me. These are the things that we say, Lord, because we know your grace is full and your mercy abounds. So hear our Lord, our prayer, and redeem us in Jesus' name. Amen. As a redeemed people, we are welcomed at the Lord's table we are invited to receive the bread, which symbolizes the broken body of Christ. We are invited to receive the cup, which represents the blood of Christ shed. These are the gifts that we receive together today. And so let me bless the gifts with a word and a prayer, and then I will show you to how to receive them together. For Jesus gave us this gift as a way to put us on the right path for him and remember the path that he had set forth for us. So he gathered with his disciples at the, at, the, at the table on his last night before he was arrested. And he took the bread that was there on the table and he broke the bread and he gave thanks to God. And he said, this, this is my body. It is broken for you. And he told us to take it and eat it and remember him. And then he took the cup that was at the table, and again, he gave thanks to God. He blessed it. And he said to all that were gathered there, and to those of us as we receive it this day, this is my blood. It is a new covenant poured out for you and for any and all who drink it. Drink this and remember me. Lord, we ask you now to pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup, on these gifts as we receive them in our homes, yet as a community of faith. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on our gifts of Holy Communion, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be redeemed and be for the world the light of Christ, the way of Christ, the peace of Christ for all who come to meet us in Christ's name. Lord God, we give you thanks and ask your blessing upon this meal and your blessing upon us. 
pour out your Holy Spirit here in ways that make us one with you, one with Christ, one with one another, and one with all the world. Amen. If you are receiving the communion we send home with you, we will remind you to point the arrow of the cup away from you and lift up just the clear imprinted wrap and pull it back. That will reveal your bread to you. You may receive that now, or you, if you would like to receive them together, may set that down for a moment and take the silver arrow, still pointing away from you because we don't want to get it on our clothes, and we pull that back, and now your cup is ready. Let us receive together the bread and cup, the body and blood, the gifts of Jesus Christ for our redemption and our invitation into a life, a way of peace. Now, as people redeemed, restored, and redirected on your path to peace in Christ's name, let us continue to worship. Welcome to our prayer time as we worship together. I want to share with you just a couple prayer requests as we um, turn our hearts to prayer and the care of our Lord. We do want to let everyone know of the passing of Tom Everett on December 3rd. Um, we will extend our sympathy and our care to the Everett and Johnson families. Um, we want you to know that we will have visitation, or there will be visitation, for um, Tom on Wednesday, December 9th, from 4 to 7 p.m. And then his funeral will be on Thursday, December 10th at 10 a.m. And all of this is at Red Path Firth Funeral Home here in Warsaw. So you'll want to make note of that on your calendar and send your cards or your notes um, or your memorial gifts as you see fit to, um, and maybe attend if that is something you're comfortable with to celebrate and honor Tom's life. So we also want to continue to pray for William Coons, that is um, Deb Marshall's grandfather, and uh, he um, is now at home with hospice, so we want to keep um, William in our prayers. We also have been asked to pray for Justin Kirshner. Um, he is a young man here in Warsaw who is uh, dealing with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and um, surgery to um, handle that. So please uh, keep Justin and his family in your prayers. These are the things that I would lift up to you as we pray today. I invite you, if you are uh, able, to uh, text or call me. With your prayer concerns, you can also email the church office at uh, wcumcadmin at walnutcreek.com. We would love to uh, share in prayer with you. It is uh, who we are as a people of faith. We believe that uh, praying Christians are faithful Christians and that one of the primary jobs that Christ gave us in caring for one another is to lift one another up in prayer. So let's pray to our Lord. God, you are a gracious God. We know this because in the midst of sin and in the midst of a fallen world, you came into the world as a child, as an infant. You came in in a vulnerable way so that the vulnerability of human beings could be overcome, the sin of human beings could be overcome. And Lord, you came into the world in this way so that your grace your love, your hope, and your purpose could abound. So God, knowing your gracious nature, we call on your name now and we give to you our hearts in prayer. We lift to you, Lord, the Everett family. We lift to you, Lord, um, 
We lift you Tom's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. God, we ask that um, you will, as he and his wife drew them together as family, you will draw them together as family now and strengthen them for the days ahead, for the grieving ahead, but also for the celebration of a life well-lived, a life well-loved, a faith well-fought in Christ's name. Lord God, we give thanks and praise for Tom, and we ask that you lift up his family. We ask you, God, to be with um, William and his family as he is in these uh, stages of life, Lord, where the end may be soon. We ask you, God, to lift up Justin, to bring healing where healing is possible, Lord, to bring comfort where comfort is needed, to bring your strength and your endurance that all things may be for your greater good and glory, Lord God. These are the ones we name for you in prayer, but each of us, whether we are listening to this video as we sit this weekend or in days and weeks to come, God, there are prayers on our hearts. There are hurts in our spirits. There are concerns that weigh us down, and there are hopes, hopes that lift us up. And so, God, we give those to you now. We acknowledge, God, that we're tired. We're tired of this pandemic. We're tired of restrictions. We're tired of um, we're tired of all of the ways that things aren't the way they used to be. Whether that's because of pandemic or something else, God, we're tired. And so we give that to you, and we ask you to, uh, Lord, lighten our hearts and enliven our spirits to be ever faithful and ever fruitful in your name. Lord, we give our hope to you, for this is a season of hope and peace. This Advent season, we are seeking your hope and peace, Lord, and we call upon your name that you might bring the wonder of your grace, your peace, your hope into our lives. We give you these prayers, Lord, because we know and trust and believe, we seek and we desire Jesus the Christ. And in the name of Jesus the Christ, the very one who taught us to pray, we give our prayers to you and we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to take your prayers um, to the church family, but also to give your prayers to our Lord on a regular basis. Let us be a praying people this Advent.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, God with us, God come down, bear you with peace into the week to come, that all may be a path of peace for your journey. Amen.